I think this is really interesting. My friend Mark approached me about shooting a video, that he was going to shoot a video about speaker isolation, the effects that it has on the performance, the sound of speakers. In this case, stand mount speakers and, the, and their stands. So the different types of devices, they're coupling, they're decoupling, they're the pointy, you know, like tiptoe type things, spikes, and squishy pads. Anyway, it's a very extensive uh, investigation, and Mark not only did uh, listening tests, but he also measured the differences that these different types of devices make, and even better, he conducted blind listening tests could he actually hear the differences and identify which device was under the speaker, between the speaker and the stand. So it's pretty thorough. Anyway, let's just get to it. Oh, and I've got to say, Mark has made a number of videos for this channel, and I will link to them directly below this video. But anyway, let's see what Mark is up to. This is my collection of sound isolation devices. That's my dog. That I, Kylo, please. I'm shooting a video here. I've collected these over the years, and uh, oh my God, Kylo, you ruined my frickin' take. Hopefully, my dog has stopped barking. I wish there was a sound isolation device for him. So what do we got here? Ooh, Alsop. Haven't seen that brand in a while. I've got the original aluminum tiptoes from the Mod Squad, which I've had since the 80s. AudioQuest Sorbethane. Exotic wooden footers from the late great Victor Goldstein. Highly touted in the absolute sound at the time, so they must work. Stretchy pads from China, good for bunions. And springy feet, if you enjoy watching your speakers wobble. What got me started on this was I was measuring my speakers with REW and a calibrated mic, moving the speakers around, moving the subwoofers around, trying to get a better blend between the subwoofers and the speakers. And when I was satisfied I had it, I thought, well, I got the microphone out, I wonder what happens if I put these little isoacoustics pucks under the speakers. I put them in there and measured, and lo and behold, they measured better. From, you know, 40 hertz up to 200 hertz, they were like a dB and a half to 2 dB flatter in the peaks and dips. And I thought that was amazing. So I listened and I thought it sounded better. I called up Steve Guttenberg and I said, I gotta make a video for you. This is amazing, I've made a huge discovery. I was a happy camper listening, but about a week later I thought, you know, you gotta replicate your experiment. Let's try that again. I'm gonna measure the isoacoustics along with some foam blocks and tiptoes and sorbethane and all the little things I have here. So I did like a dozen measurements and there was no difference, including with the isoacoustics, no difference. So this microphone, somebody's gotta come and take it away from me before I hurt myself. But I still thought I heard something. The reason I had never done this before is that these stands that my speakers are on are filled with about two-thirds sand and one-third lead. They're really solid. They soak up a lot of vibration. I just thought that there was no way isolating the speakers could have any benefit when the stands are doing an effective job of isolating to begin with. Now, I've heard big floor standers sound transformed when you put effective isolation under them. I've heard Kef blades just sound like new speakers. I've heard speakers on, particularly speakers on wooden floors, where the, the floors become just a sounding board, the walls too, and it everything just sounds boomy and muddy and not clear, and you isolate the speakers, 
and it cleans it up amazingly. I've heard Pure Audio Projects sound amazingly better. Lots of floor standing speakers benefit from this, but do stand mount speakers benefit from this? I didn't think so, but now I wasn't so sure. I ordered from Norman Varney at AV Room Service some EVP feet, and I ordered from Isoacoustics Aurea Bronze feet, which are the correct size for these speakers, because it's not a one-size-fits-all thing. You have to have the right amount of compression for the weight and the amount of bass that your speakers are putting out. There are a lot of theories about what makes the best isolation, and they can't all be right. If this is right, then these have to be wrong, and vice versa. So how do I test that? Before the EVPs had arrived, I put together a listening panel of my friends. Not blind, they saw what I was doing, and their opinions were all over the map. I preferred the isoacoustics overall. I thought they had a little bit more precision in the focus. I liked the isoacoustics, but not by a lot. The stacks were clearly the most dimensional. Yes. The yeah. most defined. So I decided I had to do this test myself with the help of a friend. Jens came over. Jens is famous for the Jens phono stage. He was the experimenter, and uh, we ran an AB, a series of ABX tests to see if I could pick out what was what with a blindfold on. Did I do it? Well, you have to watch till the end. I've been a skeptic for decades, sometimes closeted because I'm also an audiophile, and Sometimes I don't want to tell people that they're full of crap when I really think they are. I think a lot of tweaks are placebos. I famously told the audiophiliac that we can't trust our ears because our ears are attached to our brains and our brains fool us. <laughs> you cannot use your ears. You can't. You oh. have to use your ears, but you have to be skeptical of what pops into your consciousness after using your ears. I already had a bias against spikes and cones because I've heard large speakers sound great, dynamic and clean on top of EVPs and isoacoustics feet, but sound muddy and not as transparent on top of spikes and cones. So. What was the rationale for spikes and cones in the first place? Well, this was thought to be a one-way diode for vibrations. The vibrations go down and out and can't come back in. But that's just not true. You can look at measurements from isoacoustics or from AV room service that show that spikes don't isolate. They change what gets transmitted into the structure, but they don't isolate anything. A spike is kind of like uh, a unipivot tone arm. It's got a hard, sharp point going into a cup. Does that isolate the tone arm? No, of course not. Nobody claims that a unipivot is isolated from vibration. Up until a few years ago, there were even spikes under turntables which really need isolation. You don't see that too much anymore. However, there's another theory that they provide a firm platform for the speakers so that they're not wobbling and the woofers have something to push against. In theory, the speaker should sound more dynamic on top of spikes and cones. However, they don't. EVPs and isoacoustics Gaia's work really well under big speakers, and I've heard spikes under those same speakers transmit vibrations into the floor and the walls, and it really muddies up the sounds. To keep it simple and not make me crazy, I decided to narrow it down to three things to test. The EVPs, the Aurea Bronze from Isoacoustics, and the spikes. The idea is that Jens would put one of these devices under the speakers and play a cut. Then he would put another device under the speakers and play a cut. And then he would put one or the other 
under the speakers and play a cut. So A, B, and X. I was to tell whether X was A or B. I chose three tracks to test. Hers Against Me, Pete Velasco's Deeper, and Sohn's Anti-Gravity. These are all tracks with very deep bass, a vocal, and a very wide and immersive sound stage. We ran a series of five tests, because that was sort of my limit uh, of concentration. Sidebar. Can I just say that these ABX tests are stressful and annoying, and I was worn out after five tests. So I understand why audiophiles and reviewers don't want to do this, because it's not fun. But I wanted to prove, at least to myself, if not doubters, that these things actually work, and that I'm not just making it up or lying to you. But for the fifth test, Jens decided to trick me. Instead of switching the devices, he left one device under the speakers the whole time and then asked me what I heard. And I said, I failed this test because I don't hear a difference. And he said, actually, you passed the test because there was no difference. The reason he did that was that he wasn't sure that he could get these speakers back on the stands in exactly the same place, time after time after time. So he intentionally moved the speakers just a few degrees to see if what I was hearing was his not placing the speakers correctly, or if I was actually hearing the feet under the speakers. So he concluded that I didn't hear a difference with the toe in slightly different. Whatever I was hearing, it was really the devices under test. So we already know that I got the fifth test correct. What about the first four? As it turned out, I got those all correct also. What was I listening for? What did I hear? A lot of it had to do with soundstage. The soundstage seemed more expansive and focused, especially back in the corners, off to the sides of the speakers. One track, the sound track, had an effect off, I swear, on the wall, and I could clearly point to it and pick out what the mixer was doing to manipulate that effect in the soundstage. Same with the rest of the soundstage. It just got clearer. Sidebar. Was it a huge difference? No, it was consistent but subtle. That's probably because my stands are filled with lead and sand and they do a good job of soaking up vibrations. If I had floor standers, I think it would have been much more obvious. If I had not been able to pass the ABX test, I wouldn't be doing this video. I would just think somebody with bigger speakers should be talking about this. But I heard it. And the fact is, the Aurea Bronze footers and the EVPs sounded better than the spikes. Not different, better. What's the takeaway? If you're using spikes or cones, try something like this that absorbs vibrations. These prevent vibrations from getting into your floor and your room structure, and that prevents vibrations from coming back into the speakers from the room or from your subwoofers. Is that the mechanism for why it works? I don't know. All I know is I could hear it. Good boy. This video might offend both the trust your ears people and the measurements people because I'm kind of stuck in the middle. But that might be because I don't really know what I'm doing when I measure stuff. So I will take this mic and drop it.